Hello and welcome to episode four of the Amazon Unfiltered podcast. Today we're joined by Stefan Yordov, director of Amazon Marketing at Elevate Brands, now part of Seller X. Stefan, we're super excited to have you on today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Perfect. So Stefan, you are part of the aggregator world and the aggregator world has been getting some attention right now, sometimes for its successes and sometimes for its failures. So I want to start by asking you, what was the ideal plan or theory behind the aggregator model? I believe the initial plan uh, was uh, very straightforward. And I believe it's one of the oldest rules in the economy, like economies of scale. I actually think it is a plan that is still very, very interesting. I think consolidating, um, you know, the amount of suppliers you have, consolidating where you keep your inventory while having many, many interesting brands that you offer your products to customers to is still a very exciting promise. And I think that was the initial idea and what got a lot of interest uh, from anybody in the Amazon or like in the e-commerce sphere. I think it makes a lot of sense to have the like abundancy of choice to give to your customers while consolidating everything else. And I just think, uh, yeah, that was probably what kickstarted this expansion. Right. And that's why, you know, some of the aggregators performance being bad is so weird to me because the aggregator playbook is actually one of the oldest playbooks in the world, right? The aggregator playbook built a ton of brands. Um, LVMH, I think one of the largest, if not the largest fashion brand or fashion company, I should say in the world, is just like a bunch of hostile takeovers, a bunch of brands put together. And now the guy who owns it is like top three richest men in the world. Um, Rockefeller ran the aggregator playbook. Uh, they acquired a bunch of other steel factories or oil factories, sorry, I should say. And in concept, it does make a lot of sense. Like you guys raised some money, you guys acquired good brands and you had good people on your team. So I'm curious, like what part of the plan didn't pan out? Uh, I think it's, uh, might be a little bit too early to be making that judgment, but if we're looking at some of the shortcomings, I believe one we, everybody agrees on is just timing. I think we were all way too excited after the pandemic and we were really fascinated by the growth that Amazon has had. But at the same time, people should have factoring in that these were basically brands that are selling. They're having the best year ever. They're selling the most uh, they've sold in, in years. And I just think after COVID, when people started going back into stores, when the online demand eased up a bit, was a bit of a challenge for several aggregators. I think it was a timing and B, I just think there were several, it's still, uh, there's still the randomness that comes with the Amazon marketplace or online marketing in general. I think um, we had increased shipping rates following the pandemic. I think we had some, just some random challenges that might've presented with like, going out of stock, account suspensions, or anything that might happen to an individual seller. You know, these things, these problems are lurking and can happen to the aggregator as well. So I think it's been a, I think it's been a very exciting road. Uh, I've been a part of it in the, for the past two years only. So I, I've seen the sort of the, the highlight, the increase of the aggregator space and uh, some of the challenges there. But yeah, I think it's a still, it's one to keep an eye on. For sure. Right. That does make sense. What are some of the uh, underappreciated successes then of the actual aggregator model that maybe most people don't take notice of? I think the, the biggest one that comes to mind would be international expansion. That's actually, I think um, it's something that an aggregator, somebody who has direct relationship with Amazon, somebody who's done this for 20 other brands can actually do it fairly easily for the next brand they acquire. They can go to Canada, they can go to UK, they can go to Europe. And even I, I, I think it might be underappreciated because when you take a look at the sales that are coming in from these marketplaces, they might be not as fascinating as the US sales would be. 
But I think all these marketplaces combined will surely give you the 10, 20, 30% increase you're actually looking to gain when you acquire new businesses. So I actually think it hasn't been that celebrated, but I think that is actually a very nice lever to be able to pull when you acquire a business. And I think that is something that the aggregators can definitely double down on. Right. That does make a lot of sense. I guess since you've seen so many accounts and you're the, the, the director of Amazon marketing at Elevate Benz, what were some low hanging fruit or some opportunities for growth that the individual sellers that you acquired weren't really paying attention to? I think the, the first one will be the same question. I think some uh, sellers have only been focused on the US. And I mean, it's been a great choice for them. They were concentrated on a specific marketplace. They obviously did a great job being able to exit and being able to get acquired by an aggregator. But I think low hanging fruit, international expansion for sure. Low hanging fruit can be product launches, especially for aggregators that have been in the industry for a while and they have sort of an SOP, a dedicated process develop, uh, towards developing new products. I think this is one way for them to grow the brand, uh, especially especially if you have uh, you know a brand that offers a wide range of products. I mean, the opportunities can be limitless. You can think of anything else that would go with your already well-selling products. I would say that would be international expansion, new product launches, and I think even additional marketplaces beyond Amazon might be something that the aggregators might have a slight edge, a slight advantage compared to the other sellers, because I'm pretty sure if you develop a relationship with Walmart, if you develop a relationship with buyers at other platforms and other marketplaces, it would be easy to get a conversation going about an additional brand or an additional set of brands that you might be looking to launch. That makes sense because I personally see a lot of sellers, even successful ones, kind of lose steam after running their business for like five, six, seven years. And they kind of slow down the product launches or the listing optimization or anything like testing with the ads or any new campaigns out of them do slow down. A lot of them don't do the bare minimum anymore. So that is something that I've actually seen. And I think the fresh blood or like getting new people and new minds to work on the account can actually be pretty good. I think I uh, saw this case study actually from uh, Theresio for this brand called Angry Orange that had this disinfectant for pets mm-hmm. or, something, or this pet cleaner spray. And they only sold the concentrate or something of it. So they just launched another product line of ready to use spray bottles and they changed the main images and they did a bunch of other stuff. And I think sales went up multiple times over like three, four, five X. It was pretty impressive. The brand. Yeah, I think it's a, like it's a pretty Amazon successful areas. brand from them. Yeah. I can yeah. actually see it from a seller's point of view as well, because they are just focusing on what goes right for them. They're thinking, you know, instead of trying all these new things, if they just focus on doing what got them there in the first place, they can actually grow it. And it has proven to be true for a lot of the sellers. Like a lot of the sellers will tell me, why would I launch on Canada if I just double down on what I'm doing in the US, make sure I stay in stock, make sure I keep a close eye on the competition, make sure I sell more, I can make more money there. And I think this is uh, this is actually why it's still very interesting to keep a close eye out on the aggregator space because these people, like these companies would have dedicated people, dedicated teams towards growing these specific channels. And I think it can definitely be something that they can dedicate more attention to much more than an individual seller or a small company that has grown yeah. the brand so far. That's true. And I think many small, medium-sized sellers never really manage to build out that team, right? They either never find the right like in-house team or partner with the right agency, and that kind of stops them from taking off. So I wanted to ask, like, as an aggregator, what are some places where people have been leaving profit on the table? or some techniques that you guys use to, I guess, squeeze more profit or more margin out of an account? I I, I have to say this, and I have to say kudos to the sellers that we've been working with, because we have to keep in mind, these people or these small companies, as you said, they've grown like million dollar worth brands, and they're definitely doing a lot of things right. I actually think in some cases they have such a, closer look towards their profit margins, the products that they're selling and how they can be successful on Amazon, 
much more than somebody who will be taking over their brand during their first three to six months while they're you know, learning the, how the whole ecosystem works. I think where uh, um, the opportunity lies is again in the actual access that these aggregators have uh, have towards. I mean, an aggregator might have a self-serve DSP solution that possibly the brand might not have. As I mentioned before, the aggregator might have their own warehouses. They might uh, have better shipping costs or better cooperation with logistic companies when and this can be a, a quite a meaningful saving that they can get to so i just think it all it all will always go back to the economies of scale that the aggregator uh might be able to achieve yeah that is true and i think also the discipline of working in an aggregator forces people to I guess, track their numbers more because I speak to a lot of sellers that come to us looking for a software solution or like a managed service solution to bring their ACOS down or increase their sales. And then you ask them, okay, so what's your current ACOS or what's your attack cost? And they're like, oh, safe. I actually don't know. Let me check. Yeah. Right. And lots of them, like they're not tra tracking their net margin by ASIN. They don't know if certain things are profitable or not. So I think the discipline in being in a bigger company and just segmenting everything like, you know, this is the finance team. This is the advertising team. This is the like logistics inventory management team. I think the actual discipline of having your own job to do kind of segmenting the workout does force you to check your numbers more and be more aware of what's coming in and what's going out. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. I think like company wide KPIs, company wide monthly numbers you need to hit will definitely teach you discipline for sure. Yeah. I'm also curious, like, I know you're not on the M&A team, uh, but I'm curious, like, what what type of multiple are Amazon businesses sold at right now? And maybe what type of business would you guys look at buying? I really don't have an actual number. I can only speculate here. I think multipliers have gone down a bit in the past year. I think the uh, interest in acquiring new brands has gone soft uh, during 2023. Uh, and to give you a very, very wide range, which I'm comfortable sharing, I think in the peak of it, I think multipliers were going between anywhere from 3x to 9x. I think like the most successful brands would, would get a 9x uh, exit. And of course, there's always um, specificities that come to working with brands. Sometimes I think we'll only get a portion of it. Sometimes they will only be interested in selling a specific product line or a specific ASIN. I think it's always going to come down to an individual brand by brand basis. But the only useful uh, insight I might have on that side is I, I think they've gone down a bit in the past year. Great. Is that three to nine X of EBITDA or three to nine X of revenue? So I think it would be three to nine X of profit. So EBITDA okay. would be what gets multiplied. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. You mentioned other marketplaces. Um, there are a few out there right now, like Walmart and Instacart. Uh, I was curious, like, where is the actual opportunity for sellers and where should they get started? It's definitely going to be dependent on the brand. I think then the logical next step for an Amazon seller has always been Walmart, especially in the U.S. marketplace. Just uh, looking at how things have developed at Elevate Brands, if you are selling on Amazon, we are always interested in potentially expanding into Walmart. You know, you have the seller account, you know how to build the ads, you know how to build the listings. I think that has been the natural move there. So I think that is uh, one where uh, brands might actually look uh, towards growing. Just uh, so I don't forget to mention it, I think like owned websites and Shopify websites that the brands would have is another another great resource, another great tool for growth. Some of these brands that we've acquired already have a dedicated base of loyal customers. They already have a pretty active social presence. They have a pretty active website. So I think that's definitely one to uh, keep an eye out. And I think, especially in Europe, and I'm only just learning about these, but in Europe, there are some uh, maybe local or not so uh, you know, worldwide known websites where there is uh, still a lot of opportunity depending on the product that your brand is selling. But uh, 
if you have the resources, I think, yeah, with capital, but with everything that you can, you can raise, if you have the resources, I think experimenting with additional marketplaces can only, you can only benefit from it. Uh, you know, a lot of these sellers started on Amazon because they launched one product and it just took off. Who's to say this is not going to happen with a different uh, marketplace? Maybe not with those exact absolute numbers, but I'm sure there's an opportunity in trying out three new different things and seeing if one of them works, you know. All right, that is true. I was actually speaking to uh, someone on the Walmart marketplace team, and they said most others can expect 5 to 15% of their Amazon sales on Walmart. So I think that's a fair, I yeah. think that's a fair estimate, yeah. Yeah. How do you know, though, when it's the right time? Like if I'm in a certain category and I'm making like a certain amount of revenue per year, how do I gauge whether it's the right time for me to launch on Walmart or on any other marketplace? I think it all comes down to resources. That has been the main obstacle that individual sellers have been facing. You know, I have one PPC manager or even myself. A lot of people are just, you know, uh, themselves in a small team working with them. If it takes me 30 percent of my time to launch on Walmart, and I can use that time to launch five additional products on Amazon. That's sort of what has been holding them back. If you have the team and the capacity to launch on, on additional marketplaces, I mean, the earlier, the better. Uh, even, if you, even if your product, even if your brand doesn't turn out to be a good fit for a dedicated marketplace, you'll know soon enough and you can always choose not to pursue that opportunity. That makes sense. How high is the barrier to entry on Walmart? And obviously this depends on a lot of things, but on Amazon, like pretty much any category you launch in, like there is going to be someone out there with four or five, 6,000 reviews. A click is going to cost about a dollar to $2, obviously, depending on your AOV. And everything's kind of expensive and you have to run a loss for a few weeks or a few months to actually get ranked and start making a profit. So is it that is it that way on Walmart or like, what's it actually like? From my experience, I think it's slightly, only slightly more complicated in actually opening an account. I think you need to go through an approval process. Once you're there, it depends on the category, but I, I would expect to see um, fewer competitors from your actual identified competitors on Amazon be present on Walmart. Of course, you can utilize uh, sponsored products to try to get some ranking, but in terms of, you're gonna get like, like you said, uh, 10, 15, 20% from your Amazon sales on Walmart. I actually think you can, it's safe to expect the same ACoS in the ranges of you know, 20, 30, being like the rule of thumb average for most of the brands. And I actually think if you are doing well on Amazon, all the like all indications would be you're going to be able to do well on Walmart. You have the product listing, you have the keywords. You actually, if you're running successful PPC campaigns on Amazon, you can definitely replicate that on Walmart. So I think getting the access might be a little bit more complicated, but for brands that are already doing well on Amazon, they would be able to master Walmart pretty quickly. Hey. How about like expanding to other marketplaces versus expanding to Amazon alternatives? Like, does it make more sense for a seller to, with limited resources, to expand to Canada and the UK, for example, or should they look into Walmart first? Uh, I think Canada would be among those three. Canada would be the easiest choice because even with like NARF and with like additional fulfillment programs, even an individual seller might be able to expand to Canada relatively easy. And then I think they really need to do um, a more detailed evaluation whether they need to go towards the UK slash EU5 route or maybe expand to additional marketplaces. Even as we were talking during this conversation, like the expected ROI, the expected amount of money you may get from these expansions might be similar. If you're looking at 15% from EU5, you might be looking at 15% of Walmart. I just think it's going to come down to if you're expanding overseas, you need more expertise towards like shipping, logistics. The European Union countries might require some more um, detailed uh, monitoring of like compliance and whether your products can actually be sold in a dedicated, in a specific EU5 country. 
Uh, for Walmart, it's going to come down to like the channel expertise. Do you have somebody who can build the listings? Do you have somebody who can run PPC on Walmart and stuff like that? Right. And actually just doing the math in my head, if someone were to expand to Canada, the UK, the EU on Walmart, that's like a good 30, 40 percent increase, obviously, depending on category. But it's very, very hard to do that on Amazon with the same tackles. So assuming that the ACOS is the same. And honestly, I've seen ACOS be lower on other non-US marketplaces just because a click is cheaper and the competition is lower. And, you know, being able to add 30, 40, even 50 percent, if you're lucky, more revenue at the same ACOS or tackles is actually massive. And I've not really seen that many sellers take advantage of all this. Definitely agree with all of that. I think it takes us back to our first initial question about low hanging fruits. If it's not a low hanging fruit in the sense that it would be easy, like you can launch on Walmart tomorrow. But if you do these things right, I think that's like the percentages you can expect are like 10% per marketplace slash platform. And uh, to your point, I think it makes total sense. If you get all of these right, it can probably help you grow uh, faster than Amazon only. Right. Since you brought up that question, are there any advertising based low hanging fruit? Like if I'm just a seller in Amazon US and maybe expanding to Walmart Canada, UK and the EU isn't necessarily an option for me right now. What are some local hanging fruit that I can maybe use or take advantage of in Amazon US? Doesn't obviously have to apply to all sellers because every seller is different. But what's like some of the commonalities you've seen between the accounts? I actually think there's plenty of low hanging fruit when it comes to advertising only. Um, I'm not sure how many sellers are relying on automation, how many sellers are actually using, use, utilizing third party tools to scale. And I think this is what most of the aggregators do. I think uh, expanding to additional marketplaces has a lot of potential. Uh, especially as it relates to the ROI and the ACoS. Uh, I think you mentioned it as well. We're seeing like 20, 30 cents per click. We're seeing amazing ACoS for most of the European marketplaces. And that can absolutely be qualified as a low hanging fruit. Um, and also when you have a team on the aggregator side that has seen uh, all sorts of brands across all sorts of categories. I mean, just the expertise of what would work. Like, should I be going towards video more? Should I be launching DSP? Should I be looking at sponsored display campaigns? Should I be only focusing on what has worked for me so far? Just make sure sponsor products are being done masterfully. I think uh, the expertise in having a team that only does PPC, you know, eight hours of the day for, for several years now is a, a low hanging fruit uh, by itself. Right. And I know this is like a difficult question to answer. Like this could take two hours on its own to answer. But like if you could distill your account audit process, like let's say you guys just acquired a new brand and you're going through their ads and you're kind of auditing what they do. What are you checking first to, I guess, quantify account health or understand how good the ads actually are? Like maybe, you know, distribution of spend between the ASINs, utilization of ad types, the bids, the search terms that they negate, all of that other stuff. What are you guys actually going through? Like if you had like an hour to go through an account, what would be the top three, four or five things you'd look at? Full disclaimer, this is going to sound random, but I'll just go towards like tab by tab from the audit process we have. I oh, usually sure. like to take a look at the monthly total sales for the past 12 months because that helps me identify if there's seasonality, if this brand is selling in, you know, only summer or during winter. Then I take a look at the distribution by campaign type. Are they spending most on sponsored products, sponsored brands, sponsored display? Most of it is like 70, 80% sponsored products. I think that's still the rule of thumb there. Then distribution of spend by ASIN, as you pointed out, which are the, the ASINs. And there's always like a, a handful of ASINs that are driving most of the sales. So anything you might be able to do there, if you get them towards the top four sponsor placements, it can uh, give you the results of you know, working for a full month with the additional additional ASINs there. Yeah, utilization of additional match types, whether they're using all of them, how much they're spending on auto versus how much they're spending on manual. Um, what What's uh, like would a good be ratio for that? Auto versus manual? Yes. Uh, depending on the marketplace, ideally, ideally in the US, like 20, 30% still goes towards auto. Most of it is uh, now harvested into manual campaigns. But even across those, I don't think there's a, 
We have a lot of seasonal brands which will get, you know, paused and reactivated when seasonality comes. And it's not uncommon to see these still utilizing auto campaigns because they are performing relatively well. Um, basically, placement analysis, what, where are you getting the sales in the past? You can only go as far as 60 days back. Like, where, where are you getting the sales? Is it top of search? Is it rest of search? Is it product detail pages? And um, I think that's, that's the first hour of auditing the account, looking to see at the actual placements you're winning for the top five keywords, similar to how we had the ASINs. You have five main keywords, and this is where brand analytics has been a, a, a lifesaver. Like looking at the five keywords you have from the search query performance report, or just you know doing a reverse ASIN lookup in brand analytics for your ASIN, and seeing if you are spending enough, if you are bidding on the main keywords you have, what placements you're getting there. I think that's what the initial audit would do when we onboard a brand and uh, based on what it shows, I think you identify next moves. All right, we run a similar process. I actually just posted out something similar, I think a day back, a day or two back, and it was about ASIN prioritization. Uh, we had this brand, I think it was spending maybe 25, 26, 27,000. If you want the real numbers, check my LinkedIn. I'm just trying to we'll remember do. what I wrote. But it was like 25,000 per month at just under 50% ACOS, I want to say. And this spend was spread out over dozens of ASINs, right? So you had like dozens of ASINs. They have a 200 product catalog and they were advertising dozens of ASINs. Today, they spend around 50,000 per month, I want to say. And of that 50,000, something like 45, 46,000 is going to a single ASIN, right? And we're doing ad sales. Like I think the ad sales are like 200,000 per month now, which is 4X what we've done. And the ACOS is 20%, which is less than half of what they were usually doing. So I think ASIN prioritization is something that most brands aren't really going into. We even had this other account um, that we were auditing um, and we just downloaded a list of all of their ASINs and we got like the review data for them, like number of your reviews, um, the actual review score and their current sales and like ad sales, total sales, ACOS, all that other stuff. And we actually found that this brand was spending more on their ASINs that had under 50 reviews. And this account was huge. They had almost 6,000 ASINs. So more money was going towards ASINs under 50 reviews than their top 170 ASINs, right? So ASINs under 50 reviews were something like 35% of the account. And the top 170 ASINs were 21% of the spend, right? And of the account, I meant of the actual spend, even though those top 170 ASINs were like, I want to say 40% of the total revenue and they were getting less in spend than those bottom basins. So it is actually a pretty big deal. It is like to, to use your, like without seeing the results, the example one you, you showed me when you concentrated all of the spend, 90% of the spend going towards one ASIN, I can only assume that worked wonders for the organic ranking. I assume like you help yeah. because that's the biggest uh, effect that advertising can play. If you focus on five, 10, 15 keywords for a specific ASIN and you use advertising in support of that organic ranking, that's where the additional sales will come from. And about the second point about them utilizing spend towards ASINs, which don't have many reviews, that's actually quite okay with me, as long as everybody's aware of the strategy and that's being communicated. Like we have a 30% of the budget going towards these ASINs. We expect ACOS will be higher, but the main reason we're doing this is we are expecting increased sales velocity, which will ultimately lead to increased number of reviews. Yeah, but it, it does seem like it might come as a surprise for for some. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it isn't an issue per se. Like those were product launches. The actual issue was that some of the top ASINs, like I think the top ASIN by sessions was spending $50 a month on ads. Right. And that was the top ASIN. This is a pretty big account. This isn't like a $3,000 a month setter. This was a massive account and they were spending $50 a month on ads. So if that little of your budget is going to these 170 yeah, ASINs, in that specific context, I don't think you should be spending that much on product launches. You should be growing that top quartile and that's going to pay dividends a lot sooner and a lot like bigger than any of the other ASINs that you're just launching right now. Right? Agreed. So that was the thing. But, you know, in general, I think there is a lot of money to be made by just prioritizing a few of your ASINs. And... The, the other thing that I noticed is that individual sellers, as you say, aren't able to 
spend more short term to make more long term. Like you can spend money on ads today. And like you said, it's going to boost your organic rank. You're going to end up making more profit in the long run. But a lot of sellers actually depend on their profits as their income. And any drop in profits obviously is going to hurt their, you know, their own personal income. So a lot of them aren't willing to test stuff like this or aren't willing to invest long term because they can't take the short term loss. So I think that's also where the aggregator model is stronger, because if you've raised like one hundred fifty million dollars and you're operating a few hundred brands or a few thousand, depending on how big the actual aggregator is, you know, testing on that one ASIN for four or five months isn't going to kill your business. Right? If you go from making 10K in profit on that ASIN per month to like 5K because you raised ad spend in the short term, that's not really going to kill you. So I think that's one of the other benefits of the aggregator model. It's just that you have the luxury to test things like this. And the luxury to think like, you know, hey, I'm going to spend this money today. Uh, I'm going to expect a return like a year down the line. But that's okay with me. I think that's one of the actual superpowers of this model. I would agree with that. I would say it is very easy to fall into like the ACOS, the profitability trap, where like to your point, you're investing your own money. You want to make sure it's being spent as efficiently as possible. The problem is, you know, Short-term goals are not necessarily equal to long-term goals, which usually for most of the brands would be like dominating a certain category, ranking number one for the following keywords. So I do, I do agree with that. I think the aggregators have this cushion, this luxury of being able to experiment a bit longer and with a, a little bit more budget on the advertising side. Yeah, for sure. What do you think is the future of the aggregator model or the aggregator businesses that are out right now? I know obviously there's been some M&A going on and you've been part of it um, with Elevate Brands and Seller X. So I'm curious, what do you think the actual future of the aggregator model is? Is there going to yeah. be an aggregator of aggregators per se? It's a very interesting thought. And obviously it has been on my mind since, you know, we uh, partnered with Seller X since Elevate became part of Seller X Group. I actually think just looking at how they are structured and we are structured and having two very strong aggregators coming together, uh, SellerX mostly being focused on European marketplaces with Elevate mostly being focused on US marketplaces and, and all the synergies that are actually, you can become very obvious once you've uh, merged with some of them. It's definitely been an interesting thought. I would uh, not <laughs> dare to predict if it will happen again or, uh, you know, how soon before it happens. But I definitely think even our uh, CEO uh, has actually made this prediction a while ago. Uh, I think aggregators, acquiring aggregators, merge between similar sized aggregators might be something that um, proves to be effective because especially if they have similar processes, maybe they sell in similar categories, maybe they're stronger in a specific geographical location where the other aggregator is not so strong yet, so they can actually make that synergy. Uh, it's, a, it's following the same rule that the aggregators use to acquire individual businesses. I think it still applies on this scale, and I think it's definitely an interesting idea to, to keep considering. <laughs> Right. You mentioned DSP a couple of times. Again, a lot of individual sellers are wary of DSP because it's very easy to spend a lot of money, right? Since it's, you know, it's display ads, you can spend a ton of money very fast. And there is also an attribution issue. So your DSP dashboard can show a certain number of sales being made. But when you go into business reports, you didn't actually see the same revenue lift there. So a lot of individual sellers have become wary of Amazon DSP and a lot of them aren't really planning on using it anytime soon. So I'm curious, like, what logic do you use to figure out if it's the right time to test DSP out? And maybe how do you measure an attribute results? Um, I think it's different for every brand, but to give you a very, very concrete answer, I think you need to be comfortable with double digit ACoS on sponsored ads to be able to consider DSP. I think brands that are really, really constrained by budget and they have like 5% tacos should not be considering this. And I actually think on the attribution side, uh, you've made your point for me. 
they can throw all types of KPIs, all types of metrics uh, towards you. Ultimately, if you are concerned about the incrementality, whether DSP is adding to your total sales, that's exactly what you need to do. You can consider how much you've spent on it and you can consider whether your uh, total sales are growing with the same rate. Plot twist, they probably won't be, especially uh, when you launch, but I think that's when it's very important to get clear on the goals that uh, you're looking to achieve with DSP. I think this is why a very smart move on Amazon's side was uh, presenting the retargeting, remarketing option uh, as sort of entry level towards DSP because brands that are looking for the ROI and uh, improve the cost numbers can actually get this by targeting people that have seen your products, but maybe haven't purchased uh, people that might have purchased your products two weeks ago, but you know now might be the time to get another unit or something like that. And if you decide to go upper, like uh, higher up the funnel, you can actually have all of these metrics that Amazon presents to you and just focus on them. How many people have seen the ad? How many people for a specific audience were exposed to the ad? Uh, how many times a day? and make that decision. Um, my point here with DSP is you have to be comfortable investing money in something that doesn't have immediate ROI. But when it comes to the complications about the attribution, ultimately, you only need two numbers, how much you've invested and how much your total sales have grown. And that's something that every individual seller has access to. That is true. And I'm just going to pretend to be an individual seller that does not agree with what you're saying here, just sure. so I can kind of get into your head and figure out how you guys think about this. You know, for retargeting, you could also argue that you're attributing sales that could have happened anyways. And I've actually seen this in our own accounts. We've had $800,000 of monthly sales being attributed. It was not DSP, it was a VCPM sponsored display. They were being attributed every month. Uh, to the actual sponsored display campaigns. And the sales obviously did not go up by 800,000. We ended up pausing those and say the sales stayed the same. So how do you know like if the retargeting is actually doing anything and how do you set a limit to how much retargeting you do? Like, is there like, I had someone else on the podcast and they said, if I spend a hundred grand per month on sponsored product, I'll spend 10,000 on DSP, right? And they kind of manage their budget that way. So how do you know like when enough is enough for DSP? First of all, I think it's very difficult to have an argument with somebody who agrees with you, but I'm definitely in agreement with you for VCPM. I think in most instances we've seen, you know, that campaign type will have the 5% ACoS that you're very excited to see. But if you take a look at uh, a longer period of time, sometimes for a lot of categories, it is possible that uh, you are spending and you are uh, registering some sales that are coming in from the VCPM campaign, but you're basically cannibalizing organic organic growth. The only useful tip I would have for that particular situation is within DSP, you can actually make that distinction between view attributed sales and click attributed sales. And maybe there's a formula that uh, might be unique to your company, but you say, I'm going to uh, consider the click attributed sales to be of bigger importance compared to the view attributed sales. And as long as I have click attributed sales being X ROI, I'm comfortable investing in DSP. If I'm below that number, maybe it's time to reconsider. But um, you can definitely, definitely navigate through the complexity of all the numbers that are being included in the DSP dashboard and just identify the two, three numbers that are important to you in this particular week or a particular month and see if it works for you. Okay. And some people will also tell you like, you know, run DSP for the awareness or run it for their brand lift or run it to help push people down the funnel, or I guess, increase your top of funnel. All of these things are pretty hard to quantify. So how do you guys measure success on that end of things? Like not the bottom of funnel conversion based, like pre-marketing campaigns. How do you actually measure success at like middle on top of funnel? I think there's a lot of uh, uh, ways that can be sort of indirect indicators to this. First of all, brand awareness is definitely more easily quantifiable by brands that already have some sort of brand awareness given like operating in a given niche. 
But uh, to give you some of the metrics that you might be able to use to see the effect that this has is you might be able to see additional visits to your website. You might be able to see an increased search volume for your particular brand, whether it's on Google Trends, whether it's on Amazon or anything that might help you quantify the number of people that have searched for your brand here. If you have a brand that is very reliant on subscribe and save, you might actually see if this number is going up or down because it might be new, uh, new to brand customers that are actually purchasing and then choosing to subscribe. I think it uh, varies based on the category that your product operates in. But uh, if you have the budget to dedicate towards brand awareness, the, the measurement of it should be very similar to how you would measure ROI. The metrics uh, for ROI would be ACoS and ROAS. The metrics for brand awareness would be impressions, new to brand uh, exposures of Amazon customers or of Amazon customers and uh, it should be easy to draw two lines between your investment and then the, the results and whether they're following, they're positively correlated. That yeah, makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for coming on today. Uh, where can our listeners find you if they want to hear more from you? Uh, I think the best way to, to find me would be on LinkedIn. That's when you and I connected. That's where we agreed to do this podcast. So if it worked for us, I think it can work for, for anybody. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, and I think that would be the best place to connect. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on and thank you guys for listening in to this episode. I'll see you again next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me.